Well, 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 well. This. <laughs> if you'd like, and if you'd like, you can send it to me, and I'll, I'll show it. Oh me. yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Do you want to email it to me? Yeah. Okay. I did that last week, and it's it's fine. Ew. Okay, here it comes. Okay. And students, just like always, we're going to record our lecture today, so that way, if you guys want to look at it later. Um, or somebody missed today, you guys will have it. That goes here. Well, I could just talk. I'm really good at doing that. Um, my name's Ben Faber. Uh, I grew up in California. I, I traveled the world uh, uh, looking at avocados. My um, background is in horticulture, um, which is the study of uh, uh, bringing plants into fruition. And uh, horticulture typically is distinguished from agriculture because uh, horticulture can embrace uh, container plants as well as strawberries, as well as avocados. So agriculture typically refers to the broader category of raising plants, um, typically for, for food. Um, and horticulture oftentimes is uh, related to... Oh, how do you spell that, she wants to know. How Which... do you spell horticulture? Horticulture. H-O-R-T-I-C-U-L-T-R-E. Horticulture. And uh, somebody who studies horticulture is a horticulturist, um, not a horticulturalist, but a horticulturist. Anyway, um, I, I work for the University of California, and this is a, uh, uh, an office of the University of California that I'm speaking from. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, and my role here is to uh, do research on what are causing problems uh, for production. Um, and I actually do a lot of uh, searching for new crops that will grow in our environment. So everything that we, we grow here requires water. And what is unusual about this area, Ventura, Santa Barbara, along the coast here, is that we generally don't get freezing weather. So I, I grew up in Fresno in the Central Valley, and um, you can reliably count on about 10 days every year where it temperature drops below um, 32 degrees. So the crops that we grow here are uh, delicate plants. It, they're plants that, that cannot be grown in Fresno or Canada or, you know, New York or somewhere like that. So, so we, we really use our climate to um, make uh, uh, make a profit, basically. So people are uh, using the ground and our water to to make living, and um, th that living is off of these crops. Or, um, uh, they don't like hot and they don't like cold, and so it makes for a Mediterranean climate, that, which is defined by um, uh, a wet winter and a dry summer. So uh, I do a lot of my work. Um, you see this picture up here is of um, uh, that's a a, a, a a cactus fruit that comes from Peru, um, and it's a it's a uh, it's a thornless cactus fruit. And generally speaking, um, we grow crops here that generate income of a minimum of fifteen thousand dollars per acre. So uh, a lot of things that we grow, for example, this, this cactus will, will generate about $25,000 per acre. Mm -hmm. So these are high value crops that we're growing. Um, if you drive around, you'll see we're not growing wheat, we're not growing cotton, we're not growing these uh, crops that are grown in Kansas and Texas and other places because we can't compete with them. You know, our land is very expensive, the water is expensive, the labor is expensive. Um, uh, so we, we grow things like coffee and tea and 
Vitaya, which is another type of fruit. Um, we just started this Camellia sinensis, which is what tea is made from. Um, but we grow unusual citrus and, and avocados. So a lot of the work that I do is finding out crops that will grow well here. And then what are the problems associated with those crops? So every crop has got a weak point. Um, it, it doesn't like salinity. It doesn't like this pest. It doesn't like this disease. And so um, a lot of the work I do is finding out um, how to correct uh, diseases of, of these plants. So uh, a lot of times um, these, these plants are grown in other countries. And so one of my privileges in this job is I've been able to go to Chile and Thailand and Israel and Africa. Uh, I've been to China. More or less exploring. I'm a plant explorer. And so uh, I, I'll get some good ideas when I go to Thailand. It's, it's, uh, they grow a lot of things that we can't grow here because that's a tropical environment. The tropics means that um, it never has cold weather of any kind. And, and the day, day lengths are, are the same, you know, winter or summer. It's hard, it's hard to figure out when you go to Thailand they, they tell you, oh, it's winter here, and it's, you know, it's 90 degrees. <laughs> because, because when it gets hot, it gets really hot. Uh, and so we can't grow truly tropical plants here. Uh, we, we grow subtropical plants. And so these are actually crops that require a little bit of cold. Um, and so the most common avocado you'll find in the grocery store is Hass. H-A-S-S. -S. The Hass avocado will not grow in Florida because we need a certain amount of chilling for the Hass to flower and produce. So in Florida, they've got a truly tropical environment and they can't grow Hass avocados. They, they grow a whole bunch of other um, low oil content varieties of avocado. So um, we have some growers here planting coffee um, and this is not cheap coffee. This is coffee that um, uh, growers are getting 80 to $100 a pound for. Wow. And yeah, yeah, wow. And, um, How much does but, it sell for? So is that, that's what it, like if I bought it in the store? Well, if you go to Fringe, F-R-I-N-J, Fringe, um, is a coffee um, producer. Um, they're the only ones that are s selling the local coffee here. And they're, they're charging um, per ounce, $25 an ounce. Wow. Yeah, wow, yeah. So, you know, wow. that's an expensive cup of coffee. I took students um, last, or no, I went on the field. I didn't take students on this field trip. But the um, grower in Santa Barbara, he's growing that expensive coffee. Oh, Jay um, Rusky. Yes, I forgot his name, but he has a beautiful property. It's like in yeah. the hillside, or Galita, I think. Yeah, is. Galita, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. Cool, so, um, so you know, it's almost like you don't drink this coffee; you give it away as a present <laughs> because nobody can afford to drink it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so we're growing plants like dragon fruit, which is pitaya, um, and this is a, a cactus. It's a gorgeous piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. um, Beautiful. It's, yeah, and this comes from Central America, and luckily, one of my colleagues is Honduran. Uh, he grew up in Honduras. He went to, um, he, he got his master's degree at uh, Texas State. Um, and he, he's, he's introduced me to various growers down in Honduras that are growing dragon fruit. And, and we brought back uh, about 50 different varieties of, of dragon fruit, anywhere from the bright pink ones to yellow ones to an orange one. Um, there's a green one as well. And so th these are kind of, I call them eye candy. You know, the, the, the fruit is not particularly sweet. It's not particularly outstanding to eat, but it's, you just take one look at it and you go, ah, I want to buy that. <laughs> and the pitaya fruit is, um, is being harvested now. And if you go to a place like Bonds or Ralph's Market, you'll find it in the 
kind of more expensive corner of the produce section. And they're, they're usually selling for about five to eight dollars a piece. These are about the size of a softball. Yeah. And um, they, they actually, they grow as a weed. There's a grower out in in between Santa Paula and Fillmore who has, they, they're called dragon fruit. I think it's called dragon fruit because it's, 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 it isn't a columnar shape. It, it's, it's, it's got spindly branches that are, um, they'll drag right along on the ground. Anyway, he's planted them on his fence and he's, um, you know, it's, the, the, the plant itself has thorns on it. And so he's, he's, he's got a, a dragon fruit fence with wicked thorns on it. So, uh, <laughs> But I'm sure he loses a lot of fruit to passers-by, too. Um, uh, the next image is of Pixie Mandarin. And this is a variety that was uh, released from the University of California back in 1958. So it's been around a long time. And one of the things that makes farming fun is that they'll growers will put a spin on something. So the, the, the pixies, mandarins, are, are they're about the size of a, a tennis ball. Um, uh, the growers in Ojai say, only we can grow pixies, which is a lie. <laughs> the only people who lie more than farmers are probably gardeners, <laughs> because <laughs> pixies will grow just about anywhere, anywhere that citrus will grow. Um, but they, they put a cachet around it, um, saying that it's it's the Ojai weather is is particular um, for for growing the pixie mandarin. It's, it's pride, a, <laughs> right? Yes, it's yeah. Like it's a, it's pride. Seed, seedless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good tasting piece of fruit, um, and anyone in in Ventura County can grow them. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, slide is our, our number one citrus is is um, um, lemons and we grow a dandy lemon because we don't have hot weather like we get in Ojai or in Fresno really the best oranges best citrus in in the state is grown in places like Riverside and inland areas that do get some cold but because they get a lot of hot summer and that's what it takes to make a sweet piece of fruit so lemons don't have to be sweet right so we we grow lemons and the lemons are very sensitive to cold so you can't really grow lemons in fresno um uh, because of the frost that they get um we, uh, right now i've got two really big um, research trials going on at uh both of them are at Limonera, which is the, the largest farming company that we have in, in uh, Ventura. Um, and we're trying 30 different varieties. And you can see, you know, the, the one that is called Buddha's hand, that one that has the, the little spikes to it. Little uh, fingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually got very little juice in it. People um, raise it because it's got this really rich floral odor to it. And it, it'll make a room, you know, smell like, like you've just polished everything with lemon pledge or something like that. Because it's a very strong smelling lemon. Um, but we, there's, there's one called an Amalfi lemon from the town of Italy, which is as big as a basketball. And it has hardly any, any, um, juice in it either um it's 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 grown strictly for the cosmetics trade um and uh the, the two dominant um f flavors or odors that are put into um uh, uh perfume are rose and lemon and so there's a lot of different variations of what a lemon does smell like. And, and the, the perfumeries um, have f figured out, you know, a million and one ways to make, make something smell good with lemons. Um, another trial I'm working on right now is with avocados. Um, 
that okay in in Ventura County um, lemons and raspberries and strawberries kind of vie for the number one um, pr uh, producing crop here. Uh, agriculture is a two billion dollar, two and a half billion dollar industry in Ventura County, and um, depending on what the consumers like, they'll be eating more strawberries than raspberries or more lemons and raspberries, and so they, they kind of jockey for the, the highest value. But um, we, this trial, we, I was harvesting on Friday. I'm so sore from p picking. We picked 7,000 pounds of avocados. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. And my back <laughs> feels horrible for it. Um, when we do these trials, you, we have to take the fruit and weigh every piece of fruit, count every piece of fruit. So it's not what one would normally do when they're when you're harvesting a crop. You know, um, typical workers here can can pick three or four tons a day, you know, pretty rapidly. Um, so we had eight people out harvesting these fruit um, from 7 a.m. till 4 p.m. on Friday. Oh. So uh, so th th this is the dominant variety right here. That's the Hass avocado. And we're looking at um, 12 total varieties. Um, GEM, G-E-M, Harvest, uh, uh, Surprise. Um, these are all other varieties that are more productive than Hass. Um, so we're seeing how much more productive they are. So what other, uh, we've been looking at crops like lychee and longan. Lychee are these bright red fruit right here. Very tasty. I and mean, it's, it's kind of like grapes. You know, you put one grape in your mouth and you put another and then you put another and then you put another. Le lychees are like that. They're, they're very addictive. Um, this brown one right here, that's a longan. And uh, we started planting these about 25 years ago, and it was a very lucrative crop until the U.S. Department of Agriculture started allowing imports of these fruits from Mexico, Costa Rica, and Thailand. And those are... Uh, areas that can produce these much more cheaply than we can. So we were looking at somewhere in the range of about 100 acres planted to this, and virtually all those trees are gone now because they couldn't compete with imported fruit. Mm -hmm. One success story has been blueberries, though. And blueberries uh, are considered a deciduous plant, um, like peaches, like apples. They they drop their leaves in the winter time. Is that and, sorry? What does deciduous mean? It means they drop their leaves. Yes, deciduous, um, okay. and uh, and the ma main blueberry growing areas are Washington, Oregon, and Canada, and they they get nice uh, warm summers and they make a great fruit. Well, when we grow blueberries here along the coast, it doesn't get cold. And they're evergreen, so they're not deciduous. So they're they're in constant production um, all year round. Um, and we start off with uh, two different varieties back about 1990, and now there's about 25 varieties that um, are are planted in this area. Uh, and it's a very lucrative crop. Um, Driscoll's, uh, which has its headquarters in Oxnard. Driscoll's is the largest berry um, producer and marketer in the in the world, I think. I mean, you can go to France and you'll find Driscoll berries that come right from from Oxnard. So, um, uh, so we're looking at you know new crops. Um, we're also looking at d new ways of growing crops. So um, we're we're looking at pruning avocados um, used to be nobody ever pruned avocados nobody and, but you have problems when you have these massive 50 foot trees mm -hmm. they're almost impossible to pick mm -hmm. and so we've been evaluating different pruning methods 
we've also been looking at different poll pollinators. Okay, here's something. A pollinizer is a plant that provides pollen. A pollinator is an agent that spreads the pollen. Pollinators and pollinizers. So for years, people have looked at the different varieties of, of avocado that could help provide more pollen as pollinizers. Um, but it was pretty much thought that the pollinators, the insects that carry the pollen, were mainly honeybees. And what we found now is that uh, a lot of nighttime insects, like lacewings and moths, can can carry pollen. In fact, they probably do more pollinating than honeybees do. And one of the problems in the in the past was the the moths have a, a larval stage, a, 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 a juvenile stage that is a, a, a caterpillar. And the caterpillars love to eat leaves and fruit. And so we used to spray the dickens out of these avocados to kill all these moths. But in fact, we were probably killing the, all the good pollinators too. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, it takes a long time to learn things. And so we've taught people not to spray these caterpillars because um, they are going to grow up to be moths and they're the ones that are going to be spreading pollen and increasing fruit set. I'm glad you shared. So last week we spoke with um, two different um, pest experts, bug experts. So we had um, a speaker from Rincon Vitova Insectary. Kyra. Oh, Ron Whitehurst. Um, we didn't get Ron. We got Kyra. Oh. Uh -huh. um, I know Ron is also a lot of fun. Um, yeah. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's also really, really fun. Um, and then um, we met with an integrated um, pest management um, specialist. So very, very fun. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the agriculture is always going to be fun because there's always something new coming down that you have to learn about. And, um, you know, it's just, you're never going to solve all the problems. You know, as soon as you resolve one problem, two new ones pop up. Um, so we're always going to have new pests. In fact, there's a brand new um, caterpillar that showed up in Carpinteria about three months ago, and it's in avocados. It actually goes to a lot of other plants besides avocados, but it's first found in avocados. And it, it will go after um, apples and peaches and other um, fruiting plants. Um, so we're going to have to figure out, well, is this a pollinator and do we have to worry about it? Or is it just a pest that we have to uh, s survive at some level? You know, because you, you're never going to wipe out everything. Right. And, and in the process of trying to wipe out everything, you wipe out everything, you know, all the good bugs that, that are out there. So you always have to allow for a certain level of, of, of pests in a, in a crop. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what are we doing? We're growing raspberries in tunnels now. Um, and if you look out over the Oxnard Plain, you see all that plastic. And that, that's mainly uh, raspberries that are growing under those. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in creating these tunnels, the, it creates... A high humidity and, and creates conditions that are more um, attractive to insects and, and diseases. So um, in, in trying to grow raspberries in tunnels, we, we've created just the right environment for, for creating new, new, new work for us. <laughs> because uh, the, a lot of diseases and pests are um, exacerbated by having the tunnels. Um, we we're growing pomegranates. Um, uh, one of the nice things about pomegranates is that uh, they return a decent amount of money, but you can use poor water quality. So uh, um, most of the agriculture in this county is irrigated with well water, water that's coming out of the ground. And the well waters can be almost as bad as salt water. They've got so much salt in it. So, um, uh, you know, if a grower has poor water quality, we, we found that they can grow pomegranates and, and still make some money. And then we're looking at new ways of irrigating because we are in a Mediterranean climate. We have uh, 
rainfall that is unpredictable. Typically, you know, we average about 18 inches of rainfall. Uh, we actually got 20 inches last winter, um, and we had rain in, into May, which is kind of unusual. Uh, usually, we get most of our rain in January, and, and um, so you know, basically, you have to irrigate uh, 10 months of the year here. So we've been um, looking at different ways of irrigating um, with poor water quality. So, um, so the next is we're looking at pruning, okay? And so we call this growth management. And, and historically, we didn't prune, um, but it's but by keeping the trees down to. Uh, uh, Smaller it makes it a whole lot easier to pick. Um, we're we're also looking at these pollinators. Uh, the next slide. Uh, we've been looking at. This is a native bee right here. Um, this is not a honey bee, but this is. A, a, there's over 300 species of bees in the United States, and Ventura Santa Barbara has over 180 um, species. And these are um, what are called solitary bees. They don't uh, have large nests the way uh, honeybees do. In a honeybee hive, you'll probably find 20,000 to 30,000 honeybees in there, whereas these solitary bees will have a nest that will be just 10 or 15 total individuals. Um, and this is a, a, a surfid fly. It looks like a bee, but it's really a fly. And um, surfeit flies are significant pollinators of, of avocado. Um, they're also mean as the dickens when it comes to insect pests too. It's a very effective uh, biocontrol agent. It, it'll chomp pollen and just as easily as it'll chomp into mealybugs, uh, which can be a real problem. What kind so, of fly is this? Surfeit fly. Surfeit. S S Y R P H I D. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Surfed fly, and um, they they are a well-known biocontrol agent, um, and we hadn't realized how effective they were pollinate, uh, pollinating avocados. So the next slide is of raspberry tunnels. Um, I've been working with a variety of people. Oleg Dalgovich is a he's our veg crops advisor here. And Jamie Whiteford is a, um, he's with Resource Conservation District. Edda Tekele is a, a, a ag economist. And Lao Shang Wu is an irrigation specialist at UC Riverside. So as a team, we, we've been looking at how to um, re reduce the amount of erosion occurs in, the, in these tunnels. Because when, when it rains, all this water is hitting the, the plastic and it runs down and then it runs off. It's it's um, if you look at the water coming off, it's, it's ch chocolate brown, loaded with sediment. And so we, we've been evaluating different ways of reducing that. Um, our next slide is uh, these. That's are, a pro sorry. That, so that's a project um, with the University of California, like a research study you say, guys are doing. Say that again. Um, the, the Raspberry Tunnel Project, yeah. that's uh -huh. like a research study with the University of California? Correct, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, I'm working with Lauren Garner. She was a graduate student at UC Riverside when I first met her. Uh, she is uh, an avocado plant physiologist, and she's now teaching at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And she and I have this nutrient study looking at um, different levels of nitrogen and potassium um, to uh, optimally grow these these plants. Um, and so we're we're again this is a plant that can handle a lot of, of salinity. So um, we're t taking brackish water that um, if you drive up 101. Um, on the Ventura River, there's a planting of avocados on the hillside. And all along the, 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 the picking rows, we planted pomegranates so that 
we take the runoff water from the avocados and put it on the on these pomegranates. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at um, the profitability of, of this crop here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next is this is a uh, uh, work that I'm doing with Daniel Zakaria. He's up at UC Davis. He's an irrigation special specialist, and we've got this these uh, surface renewal devices that measure actual water transpired by the by the plants that if, by knowing exactly how much is is transpired we know how much water to apply so it's a much more accurate way of um, deciding when and how much water to apply so um so that device that big tall um yeah it's a mass that, that measure okay so that yeah, measures a, when so when the irrigation, like when you irrigate, it measures like how much water the trees are absorbing. Is that what you mean? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, this, it's amazing. Uh, surface renewal uh, technology has been around for a long time, but it's been very, very expensive. So when I was in graduate school back in the 1990s, um, I was using one of these devices and cost about three hundred thousand dollars now it only costs ten dollars so it's amazing how you know technology you know you hang around long enough it can become quite inexpensive so um that pole costs ten dollars well the device up here at the The top so this is just a mast it's just a pole that, that holds it up above the trees um wow so yeah, actually, that pole probably cost more than the than the <laughs> surface renewal device. Got it. And then, so does it like feed information into your computer or something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. That's neat. Yeah. yeah. So um, the next slide is of uh, all kinds of pests. I mean, people who who work in pest control will always have a job in agriculture. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, sunblotch is a, is a virus that hits um, avocados and causes fruit to be distorted. Shot hole borers, um, this is an insect that carries a fungus with it. So it's a, it's a pest disease complex. So the borer doesn't actually cause much damage, but it's the fungus that it carries that it eats off of. So it basically spreads the fungus so that it can eat the fungus, kind of like uh, eating cheese. Uh, and it's the fungus that kills the tree. Um, so we, we had a big study going on in, in Ojai, um, looking at different fungicides and insecticides to tr- control it. Asian citrus psyllid, this is a, oh, this is gonna, this is a killer that spreads a bacterial infection called Wanglong Bing, which is Chinese for yellow dragon, because the leaves turn yellow and um, before they die. And this will kill a tree in about five years. So uh, th- there is some brand, I mean, it's really devastated the citrus industries in, in Florida. Florida had about a million acres of citrus and they're down to about 500,000 acres now because of this, uh, this insect is, has killed so many trees. Um, Florida also has what's called laurel wilt disease, and I've been working with some folks in, in Florida. Um, it, laurel wilt disease goes after avocados, and boom, it kills them in about three months. And so there's restricted movement of planting material from Florida into California just to make sure that we don't get that disease here. Um, in Florida, everything is planted on flat ground, and it's fairly easy to to spray and treat. Um, here, you know, all of our avocados are on steep slopes, and it's, it, you know, if we get this disease in here, it's going to be very difficult to control. Um, I've been looking at different techniques to control weeds, using weed cloth, looking at um, different uh, herbicides. Um, Roundup, which is probably the most commonly used herbicide worldwide, is then um, pulled in, in some countries. It's not allowed to be sold in places like Germany and England, 
and it's quite likely that uh, Roundup will not be available to, to growers here much longer. So we're looking at alternatives to, to using Roundup. And we're looking at Argentine ant control. And if we're looking at psyllids, if we're looking at mealybugs, if we're looking at aphids, if we're looking at a lot of um, pests, if we can control ants, we can control those pests. Because if the ants are defending all of these insects because they like the honeydew that is created by the mealybugs. And so they protect um, the ants, uh, the, the, the mealybugs, they protect them from things like surfeit flies. So if a surfeit fly comes up to a mealybug, um, it will be rapidly fought off by the ants. So here, the next slide is a shot hole bore. And this is um, work that I'm doing with uh, Keith Eskelin and Shannon Lynch. Um, Shannon is a graduate student at UC Riverside, and Keith is a plant pathologist there. And so the, the shot hole bore burrows into the, the, into the tree and um, it doesn't do so much damage. It's, again, it's the fungus that causes the problem. So um, the, the, the borer is actually feeding off the, the fungus. Here, the next slide is Asian citrus psyllid. Okay. And the, these, these insects, this is the youth uh, stage, the larval stage. And um, this is a lacewing alligator. And so this is um, this is the larval stage of, of the lacewing, and that actually will get right in there and start chewing on on these guys. But the ants protect the psyllid from the alligator, and so if we can control the ants, we can control the psyllids. And so we've been looking at um, different techniques of doing ant control. Um, so far, we we've found an algae that can absorb um, boric acid. Boric acid is uh, toxic to, to ants. And um, if we combine the boric acid and this algae, the ants will come around, gather up the algae, and take it back to their nest and feed it to the queen, and that kills her. Um, so the next slide is of laurel wilt disease. This is in Florida. And these are dead trees. And once this fungus gets into it, um, the trees, they only live about three months. Um, this is a very fast acting disease. That's horrible. It is horrible. It's awful. Yeah. And it turns yeah. out that, the, um, that a lot of the forests are made up of, of, of relatives of avocado. It's called laurel wilt disease. So it's going in and killing all these native trees as well. Um, and it's it's as far north as New York. Um, they're being killed as well as um, as well as in Florida. So the next uh, slide is we're looking at weed control, and again I'm working with a team. Sonia Rios is a my counterpart in Riverside. Jose De Soto uh, was the manager of the um, Hanson Farm. Travis Bean is a specialist at Riverside, and Oleg Dagovich is our veg crops advisor. Uh, Oleg is uh, from Latvia, uh, and he, he speaks he speaks Latvian, Russian, German, English, Spanish, uh, and he, he speaks better English than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're working together on this um, trial. And then we're looking at the, this ant control. Um, and this is, I'm working with Monica Cooper. Uh, Monica Cooper is a, a farm advisor with the university up in Napa County. And she's been working with um, uh, this Knox, Knox gelatin and boric acid and spinosad uh, to control ants. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, if you just think uh, uh, what you have in your kitchen might solve all your problems. <laughs> so That's interesting. Out. So you just spread the, the students, you guys may not know what this is, but this is how like 
we used to make jello a long time ago this little box um, yeah is this so you just like spread it in the area where the ants are well actually the um yes and the argentine ants um have a nest and you'll see them boiling out of their holes um scavenging for stuff and you can see the sprinkles right there the, yes. and so they'll, they'll come out and they'll they'll gather it up and take it back to their nest oh, okay interesting uh, yeah and boric acid is a, a recognized organic um, treatment hmm. so even the organic growers can use it okay new crops uh we're looking at hops um and we're looking at new pests all the time uh this is actually a picture of a hop vineyard in san diego county and we've got three uh growers here uh with hops all three of them are up in in the ojai area but the hops grow on these long vines and they actually used these um walking sticks to get around Hops um, are what um, they make beer out of. Yeah. If anybody doesn't it, know. So it, they add flavoring to beer. Though, right? What's that? You can't really do anything else with hops, can you? Well, they're, it's an herb. So okay. some people use it as a treatment for various stomach conditions. Ah, okay. So, um, you know, it, it's, it has a bitter flavor. Anytime you come across something that has a bitter flavor, you know, that that's the phenolic component. And, you know, you go online and people are selling all kinds of things, you know, avocado seeds. Uh, I saw one the other day. What was it? I'm going, holy moly, somebody's eating that? Well, they're, they're going after the phenolic property. Um, so many things like uh, our drugs um, are phenolics. Um, quinine is a phenolic. Um, cocaine is a phenolic. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of the, 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 the drugs that we use for medicines are, 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 have phenols in them. So I think this is the last slide. Um, I, I, I sent these links to Anna uh, last Friday, and we put out a blog uh, two or three times a week, and then we've got a newsletter that comes out quarterly. And so you can go online to see these. Oh yeah, that's the one I've just posted today. Um, mm -hmm. So, so um, this is a, HLB is the Wang Long Bing, HLB disease that causes uh, citrus to die. And uh, so there's various uh, places you can get these blogs. Thank you. These podcasts. Very helpful. I'm going to pop in and see if we've got questions. Lots of them. Um, let's see. What does distributing mean? Uh, um, you distribute when you spread something around. So if you, um, if you go to a grocery store and you buy a can of coffee or a packet of coffee, there's somebody who distributed that to that grocery store. So it's, it's a way of getting stuff uh, around. If something is seedless, then how do we start to grow the plant itself? That's a good Very question. good question. Ah. Yes. So they're all vegetatively produced through grafts or cuttings. So um, in the case of, of citrus, they, uh, most of our rootstocks are produced from seed. But the scion, the, the top part, the part you eat, that, that's almost always produced by cutting that is attached to a, to a, um, a rootstock. So <laughs> they use mature tissue to, um, uh, to propagate a new plant. Um, let's see. Lemons are new. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think lemons are new. I think um, different varieties are new. Different varieties. And so something that's kind of interesting is that there are, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but people are, sometimes you guys can um, blend 
like two varieties of a lemon together and make a new one sort of a thing yeah crossing so what do we call that cross yeah breeding cross breeding yeah um and they do that with all types of fruits and vegetables so that's how they come up with um you know different varieties of of lots of fruits or vegetables i get really excited when i find like seeds from like different heirloom seeds and so i found this new company that has um they've been like cultivating seeds that are really really old um so i'm setting up a greenhouse and eventually going to plant them and then we'll talk all about different varieties of tomatoes i like new varieties of tomatoes um let's see somebody asked gelatin when you're younger you already asked about true love seeds yep i've already talked about it does anybody else have questions you guys have been good listeners today no i am really impressed with how many research projects you work on i should have kept a tally but i think like well over 10 different project studies you're working on currently and I appreciate your time. Um, are, are, how many studies are you working on? Oh my goodness. See, some of these are short term, some are long term. Okay. So like the this ant study, I've been working on that now for five years. Okay. The avocado trials, I've been working on those for 30 years. Wow. Um, the citrus trials, I've been working on those for 25 years. Uh, the irrigation trial in raspberries was, uh, that was a two year trial. So, you know, different, pro okay. So working with trees always. takes a long time, mm -hmm. you know, it, okay. trees don't start bearing until they're about year five. Okay. So you, you got a lot of time invested in trees. Very good. What do you anticipate will be, um, with what you with what you know, um, what do you anticipate like the good, interesting jobs for agriculture are going to be in the future? Say in about you know, 10 years when these students are ready to, to come Computers, out. computers, computers, like ah, that's okay. new. I mean, uh, you know, everything is going digital. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, having a good background in math. I mean, you have to, <laughs> there's no way around it. Being able to communicate. I told you about Oleg Dagovich. He can speak five languages and he speaks them perfectly you know um it you know really he's a good communicator and i think learning basic communication skills either with the computer or verbally or written i mean there's there's no yeah. way of getting around the written language um uh, yeah marco says computers are taking your jobs no marco i think the message no. is that your generation is um learning how to use computers in a way that say folks in my generation or other generations aren't so um you guys will be the ones to help other folks use computers yeah um you can look at it that way <laughs> yeah computers won't take your job what do i mean um well, so that picture he had, the picture he showed us of like the big tower in the, in the, in the citrus, in the crop, um, that's really impressive. And maybe lots of farmers are using that. I've never seen one of those, but um, I think that, I think that um, it's a big adjustment for people who have worked in agriculture for a long time. They know how to, they know how to farm, but now they have to shift their thinking to learn how to, incorporate technology into farming um and that is a big change for them mm -hmm. that's i guess what i mean that makes sense yeah yeah <laughs> so what is it that you, that you students want to learn what, what is it that excites you what do you guys want to learn i know our young people care a lot about climate change composting john says wants to learn more about composting. Well, uh, based on the research that we started here in 1990, there's more composting done in this county than anywhere else in the United States. Wow. And if you go into an avocado or citrus orchard, you'll see the mulch that's derived from Oxnard yard waste is turned into a, a material that is 
uh, most growers are using as a mulch now. And it's all work that we did here, you know, and you know, it used to be they'd take it to the landfill, you know, yeah. dump it. It was, mm -hmm. it was called green waste, but it, you know, we, we put value on it. And now um, it costs about, oh, $600 an acre um, to, to use it. But people see the value in it and they, uh, growers do it all the time now. Very good. Well, does anyone else have any more questions? All right. That so one. is oh. this summer is this summer school? Are you guys in summer school? We're that... in summer school. So we're um, about halfway through. And this is a new class at Rio Mesa that um, so I'm working with our career technical education program. And um, it's something we wanted to do, obviously, in person. Um, oh, you lost about 800 wiggler worms. Where'd they go, John? You can unmute yourself and tell us. John is composting at home. <laughs> I think they basically all died. Your worms died? Yeah, like only recovered like four. Hmm. So he has a he has a new um, worm composting bin at his house, and he's um, setting up a vermicompost. Oh, good. Yeah, I, you know, they may not have died. Maybe you just can't find them in there. They might be deep in there. They migrate. Uh-huh. No, I was, uh, yesterday I was trying to get it out so I could start over the thing. Like most of them are all smushed or either, Ooh. or either drowned. Yeah. Like in the bottom thing. Well, so the bottom is open? No, well, for some reason, I don't know how, but they got through the newspaper that I had on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So they got into the collection tray. I found like two or three in the collection tray. The rest are basically all smooshed. Oh. Well, there's still hope. <laughs> they might come back. They yeah. might keep repopulating. So yes. Yeah, you can't give up. Um, one ag teacher I met a few years ago, he told me that what he likes most about teaching agriculture to young people is that it teaches us how to problem solve. Because when you're farming, there's always a challenge. There's always something yep. new. And so, um, and I really like that kind of attitude and outlook because um, even if you don't go into agriculture, like you can apply that in, I think it's just a good outlook to have about, um, you know, there's always going to be a challenge to face, but I think in farming, like there's just so many factors that influence what you're trying to accomplish your crops. There's bugs, there's pests, there's rabbits, there's gophers, there's, you know, the weather. Um, there's the changing prices of the crops you're growing. And um, so it's just, it's, I think um, farmers are really resilient people. Um, so you can't give up. We'll, fi we'll figure out, we'll get your worm compost going. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're also going to, so we're going to let Mr. Faber go. And then you guys are going to stay so we can talk about your final project. Okay. If there are no, if there are no more further questions, anybody else? No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Um.